for a long time, so I kind of get it. Um, so I'm really excited to be with you today. I titled my presentation, Do You Know Your History? Because if you don't know your history, they say history repeats itself, the good and the bad. So. Oh, okay. I'm used to walking around, so it's hard to stand still, but um, there, she can see me. So I have some goals for the presentation today. I want you to know who I am. I want you to know why I am here in Ulm. I want you to see that we are connected, you and I, and we'll talk about that. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my family history here in Ulm. And then at the end, I want us to talk about racism, anti-Semitism, and nationalism, and what each of us can do to make this a better world. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm from the US. I was born in Chicago, and this is where I live. This is called Lincoln Park. It's a beautiful park near the lake. We have a big lake, much bigger than the Bodensee. And um, as you can see, we have lots of tall buildings, but we also have houses and apartments just like you do here. Uh, this is Chicago. It's kind of in the middle of the US, so we call it the Midwest. And it's north, and this is the lake that I talked about. It looks like an ocean. Has anybody been to the US? Anybody to Chicago? You have? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, where did you go? Um, for a vacation. Uh huh. Then we went to the. You went to Lincoln Park. Great. So you can talk to your resident expert. So who am I? So I am a German citizen, as of last August. I was a professor for many years. I was also a teacher for many years. I've been in education for 40 years, before your parents were born, probably. And um, so there I am at graduation at the university. This is me and my husband. He is from the Republic of Honduras in Central America. And he was a journalist for 40 years and he covered all kinds of world politics all over the world. He covered South America, he covered the Vietnam War, then he um, worked for the Boston Globe, which is a newspaper in Boston. After that, he went to Newsweek magazine, and that's where he traveled the world. And then when I met him, he was working for TV News in Chicago, CBS News, it's one of the major TV stations. Um, so. Um, so I have a brother named Bob, and he's a doctor, and that's his wife with him, and that's one of my grandkids, my daughter, my granddaughter Annalise, who's named after my mom. Um, these are my two girls. This is Erica, and she's married to a German from Rosenheim, and she met him in China. Can you believe it? One night in China, and that was it. It was a good night, I think. This is my other daughter. Oh, and she's Christian. That's my other daughter. Her name used to be Christina, but it's Christina Alana. And because she's chosen to be Jewish, and she married a rabbi's son named David, her name is now Alana. She changed her name because she wasn't comfortable with a Christian name. And these are my five grandchildren. So you have Annalise, Noah, Jacob, Lucas, and Marcus. Then I also have 
another a multicultural family from my husband's side. So in April, my stepson got married, and he married a Filipino woman. So as you can see, we're kind of all mixed up. And here I am teaching, and you know where I was teaching in that picture? You'll never guess. That was my father's gymnasium in Serbia, because I have been studying my roots. And this is the audience in Serbia. So I just wanted to let you know a little bit about me. And of course, there's my husband, Don. And you know what that restaurant is on top, looking at the Munster Platz. It's called the Bella Vista. OK, so I'm in Om because I've been looking for my family's roots. And this was an article that was written in the newspaper. I've been in a lot of newspaper articles. Um, but I have been on the, looking for the path of Albert Einstein because he is my relative. And I'm working with, this is Ingo Bergman from the Stadtblum, and he is making a family museum for the family Einstein. Now there's also another big museum that you know about that um, uh, Frau Hecker Danschling is also a part of, and that's called the Einstein Discovery Center. But this one is a family museum, and it is um, near the um, Schwor House. So what do you think? And I want you guys to participate. I expect you to. When you see this picture, what do you think? Yes? Great physicist, yes. Physician, yeah, I would make the same mistake because my German is not so good. My English is schlecht. So what else do you think when you see the picture? Thank you for participating, I appreciate it. What's your name? Mick? Nick? Nick, it's hard with the mask. Thank you. Who else, what else do you think when you hear or see this picture. Yes. Life changing. He did a lot to change lives. Very good. What else? World famous. And where was he born? In Ulm. What else do you think when you see his picture? Yes. Genius. Genius. Excellent. What else? Come on. I know you guys are smarter than that. One more. One brave person. Okay. He won a Nobel Prize. Yes. Okay. So maybe you said he was an Homer a physicist, a Nobel Prize winner, a genius from Ulm, a great physicist. But for me, he was much more. He was a great humanitarian, and if it weren't for Albert Einstein, I would not have been born. Think about that. I owe him my life. So I ask again, do you know your history? Think about it. I'm going to tell you my story. So do you each know where your mother or father went to high school? Yes. yes? Did anyone go here? No. No? Where did they go? India. Where? India. In India. Wow. Have you seen their high school? Yes. That's pretty cool. Where else? Passau. Okay. Okay. Have you been to the schools? No. No? Wow. Long way. You've not been there. Maybe one day. Maybe after the war is over and it's a little safer in that area. Yes? My father went to uh huh. And your mother? Uh, I think she went to 
In Romania. Wow. Yes. We have a Cristo Ray where I live. ¿Sabes español? Yo también. Okay. My Spanish is much better than my German. Okay, so how old are you guys? Who's 15? If you're 15, raise your hand. If you're 16, raise your hand. If you're 17, raise your hand. Did I miss anybody? Anybody 14? Anybody 18? No, okay. This is important. So this was my mother, and her name was Annalisa Hirsch. And she went to school here. But when she went to school, what was it called? No, it was called the Mädchen Oberreal Schule. It was just a girls' school. And that's why it's important for me to be here with you today. And when she was at this school, she had a very special friend. Her name was Sophie Scholl. They were in the same class. They were both born in 1921. But there was a major difference. Because Sophie Scholl was Christian, and my mother was Jewish. But when I came to Ulm the first time, I took a tour of the city, and I saw the statues of Hans and Sophie Scholl. And I went back to my mom at the hotel, and I said, Mom, do you know about this story? About this valiant girl and her brother, and what they did to fight the Nazis? And then my mom started to cry. She said, she was my friend. And she gave me the book about the white rose, so I learned about it. That's part of my history. So I want you to look at all the kids in the room here. Look at your neighbors. Because when they were 15, they didn't know that in 10 years, Sophie would be beheaded, or that my mother would be in another country. Nobody had any idea. So look at each other. What do you think your destiny is going to be? What do you want to do in the world to make a mark? Think about it. I want you to think about that. Because nobody knows what their fate is. Okay, let's come back together. This means to everybody needs to be quiet again. I asked you these questions because I want you to be thinking. You guys are going to start your life. You, you are at the cusp of becoming almost adults. So what you do in school and beyond, it's going to matter. It's really serious. It's important. So I'm going to tell you about my family here in Germany. So we were in Germany in the German Empire and in the Weimar Republic. In 1871, Jews finally were allowed to become citizens of Germany, or Ulm. And in January of 1886, my great-grandfather, his name was Adolf Moss, he became a citizen. And he was married to a woman, and her name was Friederike Einstein. And for a Jewish family, it was a big deal to be a citizen. My great-grandfather, Adolf Moss, was a businessman. This is an advertisement I found in the archive in Stadt Ulm. And it's from the year 1887. And he had a bedding store. Do you know the Hotel Ulmer Spatz? It's behind the Munster? Yes. 
And there's like a Turkish um, kebab restaurant right there. That's where the that's where the shop was. The Einsteins also had a business in Ulm. It was called Israel and Levy. This is the building it was in. It was part owned by Helene Einstein and Albert Einstein's father, El, Ed, uh, what's his name? Herman, excuse me, Herman, he worked there when Einstein was a baby. And I'm gonna tell you more about it, but um, this is going to house a new museum in Ulm called the Einstein Family Museum. And it's right by the Schwor House. You guys can walk there. It's Weinhof 19. This on the left is my grandfather. Let's see if I can point. That's my grandfather. His name was Leopold Hirsch. This was his store. And it was on the Hafengasse. 18 to 20, and here I am in front of the same building, and it's now a retail store called Marquane. How many of you have seen that store? It's right in downtown. So I walk in there and I get all excited because that was where my grandfather had his shop. It was started by his father, Maurice Hirsch, in the 1880s. This house here was the apartment building that my mother grew up in. It was on Neutrostrasse 36. And so it's right now, it's like at Neutrostrasse and um, Karls, Karlsplatz, is that what it's yeah. called? Yeah, and it's, it's being renovated by Mueller, Mr. Mueller. And I don't know what he's building, but he's building his empire there. This is a picture of my mother with her neighbors in 1928. So she was seven years old. And uh, it was, she was born in 1921, like I told you, the same year as Sophie Scholl. And that's the same year that, no, that Einstein got this Nobel Prize. It was actually awarded a year later in 22, but he got it for 1921. So it was a big deal in our family. This is a picture of my mother and her older brother, Fritz. He was 12 years older than she was. And my mom loved the Donau. She went to the Donau every day, took walks. She just loved it, just like probably you guys do. Here she is with one of her girlfriends on the Hirschstrasse. She was a teenager. So, do you all know what happened to Ulm in the 1930s? What happened? 1933. Nobody knows? Come on. Everybody knows. Okay. So the Nazis came to power and life changed for my family, who was big. They were very integrated into German society. So this says Jews are not welcome. So people had to wear the star because of Judith. And when the Nuremberg Laws were passed in September of 1935, lots of changes happened. Um, people were, um, they lost their citizenship. My grandparents lost their citizenship. My mother did. Um, if you go into um, her birth record in the archive, they wrote in, her name was Annalisa. She had no middle name. They wrote in Annalisa Sara. Every girl became Sara, and every boy got the name Israel. And it's written on their birth record. Then it was repealed in the 1940s later. But it's there. I should have made you a picture. You could have seen it. Um, and then at Easter of 1936, 
Every Jewish child was expelled from school. What does it mean to be expelled? Do you know that word in English? Yes. Okay, so my mother was 15 years old, the age that many of you are today, and it wasn't that long ago that the rest of you were 15, and she could not go to school anymore. None of the Jewish kids were allowed to go to school. So there is a, a book that was published. Um, it's a, a memory book of all the people that uh, were killed in the Holocaust. And when I got that book, I couldn't believe it because there was this picture on the cover. But I had seen this picture since I was a child. This was my mother right there. And these were Jewish children who had been expelled from school. And this guy was the cantor, but he became the principal. They started a little school in the synagogue. And my mother was so humble. She always told me she was a Girl Scout leader. But when I came to Germany that time in 1997, these, some of these people who survived told me, you know, your mother, she was my leader. She was my confidant. I said, what's that? And they said, well, when we couldn't go to school, your mother became our teacher. She taught us how to read and write and compute. And then we all wanted to join Hitler Youth, but we weren't allowed to. So she started a youth group, and she took us skiing and skating and hiking and biking. And here you have and so, and of these kids, five were deported, four were murdered, and one survived of these children that were deported. But here she is in an outing in, in the woods with her kids. You see the kid playing the accordion? When I was five years old, my mother made me take accordion lessons. The accordion was bigger than I was, but I think she thought it was very important. This is an entry from her diary, which I have translated into English. Maybe you can read the German, but she wrote, this was on October 30th, 1936. So this was pretty soon after the kids were expelled. When I walk through Ulm or along the Danube, I'm overcome by a strange feeling. I want to absorb every little bit so that when I'm gone, I will never forget it. Can you imagine writing that now at your age? And she said, I find Ulm and the region around Ulm uniquely beautiful. I will always yearn for it and will never forget my Ulm and my Danube and my Trommelweise. On the 9th and 10th of November of 1938, I think you all know this, was the pogrom Nacht. And the um, Jewish men were pulled out of the houses, my grandfather too. They were made to take off their clothes in November. It was cold. And they had to march in a fountain with water. And they were beaten, and a lot of them were taken to Dachau, and some of them died just because they were Jewish. My grandparents at that time, they lost their business, and they knew that they were gonna to have to leave Germany. It wasn't safe anymore. So my, parent, my grandparents wrote to Albert Einstein for help. That sounds like a big stretch, doesn't it? So why would Einstein be interested in my family? because my family was his family. So, oops, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So, here's Albert Einstein. His grandparents were Abraham and Helena Moss. His father was Hermann Einstein and his mother was Paulina Koch. His sister, 
Herman's sister was Frederica Einstein. And remember, I told you about her. She was my great grandmother. And she was married to this guy that became the Germans, the Ulm citizen, Adolf Moss. They had a lot of children, but I'm just going to talk to you about my grandmother, Frida, and she married Leopold Hirsch. They had my mother, Annalisa, who married my dad, and then here I am. So they were first cousins. And if you know anything about Einstein, he married his other first cousin, Elsa. That was his second wife, so they were pretty close. And he used to come to Ulm, and, or they'd meet at the Bodensee, or at the, the Alps. And, and they had family reunions. And that's how he ran into Elsa again. And he knew my grandmother really well, too. Starting in the mid-1930s, start, Einstein started writing letters to help different family members escape. So this one was... Um, about um, one of my grandmother's cousins, and it was to help him to go to England and then to Palestine. Einstein saved my mother. This is called, oops, I wish you could see this. I could maybe get it bigger for you, um, for your teacher. But this is a, a, called a ship's manifest. These are all the people that sailed on the ship. And so my mother left Ulm by train. She was only 18 years old. When she got to the French border, now this was August of 1939, the French police detained her for a whole week and questioned her, what did you see? Where are the troops? Because they knew that the Germans were gonna start a war. And um, she almost didn't get out. Finally, one of the guards liked her so much, he proposed marriage. But she said, no, I'm going to America. So, anyway, if you could read this here, let's see if I can find it, well, wherever it is. These, this tells like the person's name, their parents, their birthday, their city, and then these things here tell where they're going. So, my mother's, this came from, uh, this was pulled out. My mother's father was Leopold Hirsch, Neutrostrasse 36, Ulm, Germany. Her destination, New York. And her destination here, cousin Professor Albert Einstein, 112 Mercer Street, Princeton, New Jersey. So she went to live with him. That's how she got out of Germany. He paid her ticket and he supported her when she first came to America. And she sailed from Le Havre in France. These are my grandparents, Leopold and Frida Hirsch. Even though they had papers from Einstein, it took another year for them to get a visa. And by the time they got it, it was September of 1940. And you all know what was going on. It was already a war. So they couldn't go to France. France was at war with Germany. It wasn't safe. So they took a train from Ulm to Berlin, and for Ber from Berlin, they took an airplane, their first flight, to Moscow. And from Moscow, they boarded the Trans-Siberian Express, and they went across Russia, Siberia, China, to Japan. I've got their route, let me show it to you. So, first they were in Ulm, then they took the Trans-Siberian Express to Manchuli, then to Lake Bakal, then to the Russian-Manchurian border, then they arrived at Harbin, China, and they went to Manchukuo, to the Korean peninsula of Busan, and then they had to take a boat to Japan. And they got to the west coast of Japan, but the boats for the United States left from Kobe, which is in the north. And so they had to go by land to Kobe. And from Kobe, they left. They crossed the International Date Line, and they arrived in Honolulu 
and then finally to San Francisco. They went halfway around the world the other way. And Einstein paid their trip. Hugo Moss, who was um, one of my grandmother's brothers, he didn't believe that anything would happen to him. He was a prominent businessman. And unfortunately, he and his wife were deported to Theresienstadt, and they were killed there. That's a concentration camp in Czechoslovakia, or the Czech Republic today. Hugo's son, Alfred, who was my mother's favorite cousin, he became the citizen of Ulm. You know, like on Tvor Montag yesterday, people got the citizen award. So he got it in 1997, and there's a street named after him. And his grandson, Michael, was on the city council in Freiburg for 20 years. He just retired. And so um, they've worked their, they worked their whole lives, really, to try to make things better. But her cousin came back to Germany in the 1950s with all the racism and tried to mend fences. He did that his whole life, trying to make things better with, uh, with the German people who had been his enemy, who had wanted him dead. It was very hard, though. His wife had a nervous breakdown here. It was not nice. Um, now, my Uncle Fritz stayed in Germany, too, and he also didn't think he was going to be touched. And then one day, the Nazis came, and they knocked on his door, and they deported his boss to Auschwitz. And he was supposed to go, too. This is quite an interesting story, because here, Einstein tried to help, but he said he had written so many affidavits for people by this time, that they were no good anymore. So well, how did my uncle save himself? So remember my great-grandfather Moritz that started the store on Hafenbad? When he was 14 years old, he and eight of his brothers sailed to America. And they lived in America long enough to become citizens of the United States. But think about it, it was the 1850s to 1860s. What was, do you know what was going on in the United States then? Civil War. And they were in Tennessee, which was in the South. So he hated America. And he came back to Ulm. And he married a woman named Anna Moss. And they started their family here in Ulm. And that's why my family lived in Ulm. But he convinced, Fritz, my uncle Fritz convinced the Nazis that he was an American citizen, he shouldn't go to Auschwitz, and he had this very famous relative in America, and if they deported him, they would get in a lot of trouble. And somehow he scared them, and they put him in a POW camp for Americans until the end of the war. It saved his life. And there he is in the camp. But then, when the war was over, they were so excited that he was um, let out of, of prison. But when the Americans came to liberate the camp, they said, well, you're not an American. That's not true. And so they sent him to a camp in North Africa, in Algiers. Excuse me, I need water. So my uncle met a girl in this camp. Her name was Greta. And he wrote to Einstein and said, will you help me get to America? And will you help me get this girl out of, out of this camp? Her whole family was murdered. And you know what Einstein said? I will only help if you marry her. So the two of them thought, OK, well, let's get married. We can always get divorced when we get to the United States. But she ended up pregnant, and they had a child, and then the rest was history. They stayed married for 40 years. So I guess Einstein changed their lives, too. In order to get them to the United States, these are the documents Einstein had to produce.
I was telling you about what um, what it took to bring someone to the United States at that time. An affidavit is like a letter of support, but you had to do more than that. You had to prove. So my grandfather, El Professor Albert Einstein, and then my mother's first husband, Fred Rosendahl, they all had to produce letters. Excuse me. And um, Einstein had to have three certificates from the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton stating that he had a job and that he earned a certain salary. Then it says that he had to have his bank records forwarded to the US government. He had to show that he had enough money in case they couldn't survive with their own money that he would pay their way. So it was a lot. His income tax return, his war bonds, a copy of the the assets means like your the title to your home. They could take your home away if your relative couldn't have enough money in the United States. So it was a big thing to um, to sponsor somebody. But it worked. They left Algiers for New York. And then he writes, you know, that he, it's a miracle. He's so glad that Fritz is released and that he's on his way to the States. So, new beginnings for my family. This is my mom in front of her, her car. When she first came to Einstein's house, he gave her some money to get started. A couple, like $200, but that was a lot of money in 1939. And she went out to get driving lessons because she thought to live in America, you have to be independent. And for her to be independent, she felt she needed to have a car and to drive. Well, Einstein never drove a day in his life. And he thought that that was the stupidest use of his money. And he was very upset. Then he wrote a letter of recommendation for my grandfather so he could get a start in San Francisco. And then my grandfather wrote the story of their flight from Germany. And it was published in the San Francisco Chronicle. And it was divided into five pieces. And so it ran for five days. And my grandfather got money for this. This was his first paycheck in America. And he only got it because of Einstein. And then he starts writing, this is a translation, but he's changed his writing from signing it Albert Einstein or A. Einstein to just Albert. So he felt closer to them too. So he says he was happy to learn from their letters that they were getting along fine. And he thought it was wonderful that my grandfather actually wrote that story in English. His father who had lived in America taught him English. And then he says, please do not give back the money that I have given you for the trip. It could not have been spent in a better way, and I am happy about that. Please do not mention it anymore. And best wishes to all of you. So you can see that was very generous, wasn't it? Because you can imagine paying for my mother to come from, from Germany across Paris La Havre to New York, that cost a lot. And then to have my grandparents go across Siberia, China, Japan, that was very expensive. But anyway, he would not take a penny back. So there they are getting their new start in America. And then Einstein influenced my grandparents one more time. Because my mother got a job in New York City, and she loved her job. And her parents were in San Francisco. And so her parents felt that she was a young girl. She should come to be with them. And Einstein in this letter says that if Annalise has a good place and a good job, you should let her keep the job. So 
what she did and while she was in new york she then got married she met a man and got married to a german man and that was her first husband his name was also fritz fred rosendahl and einstein writes to my grandparents how much he likes my grand my mother's first husband so that he was really strong like something from the bible and um unfortunately he died after only six years of marriage he had a heart attack he was only in his 30s and so my mother was a young widow so here they are but no husband for my mom so you have uh, my mother my grandfather this is um the little baby that remember my aunt got pregnant this is my cousin jerry that's my uncle fritz that's great uh, this is my grandma my oma and this was my mother's mother-in-law from her first marriage now this lady was a pretty spectacular person so my mother had lost her husband my mother was 26 or 27 years old and she was a widow and her mother-in-law said she didn't think she should be alone so she had a friend who had been in a, a camp a prison camp with a yugoslavian doctor and this doctor was coming to new york for a medical conference and wouldn't it be a good idea to fix them up for a date so they set a date for them and they were going to meet at this very fancy hotel in new york called the plaza well my mom went my dad went but they didn't see each other and each of them were so angry they're like you stood me up i don't ever want to see you but the matchmakers said come on give that person another chance it was an honest mistake so my dad and mom met and on the first date now my mother must have been beautiful and charming because he proposed on the very first date it took my mom six months to say yes but then she did and they moved to chicago and that's where i was born but as you can see if it weren't for albert einstein my mother and my grandparents would have gone to Trusenstadt with my mother's uncle my mother loved Ulm. She carried Ulm with her her whole life. She never said a bad word. I never knew about all the bad stuff that happened here because she never talked about it. And so I didn't know my history. So um, we ate Spätzle, Wiener Schnitzel. My mother had an Edelweiss flower necklace. She loved the Ulmer Spatz. She didn't have this one, but she had lots of little Ulmer Spatz statues all over the house. She had a German <coughs> sign. She had that plate from Ulm. And so she was always proud to be German. And I think when she said she was German, she would stand taller, like she was like another foot taller, I swear to God. So much so that when my mother passed away, we put, I don't know if you can see this, we put an Omer Spatz and some Edelweiss on her gravestone because that mattered. So this is the new generation. I think I already told you about them. And like I told you, we have a very multicultural family. And it's not always easy. We're still fighting about things because they're just hurt feelings, you know, and there was a time where um, Erica and Chris were coming for the American holiday of Thanksgiving. They were supposed to stay with them, but his parents, the rabbi and his wife, they didn't think a German should stay in their house. So there's a lot of angst there, right? And when I got married the first time, my first husband's mother, She's like, you shouldn't marry her. You know, where I grew up, there were signs in Hyde Park is a fancy neighborhood in Chicago. No Jews, no blacks, no dogs. So racism is a big deal. 
and it persists, and it persists here too. I think that the Germans have done a better job than we have in the United States, to be really honest with you. Um, this last year, we put in a Stolperstein. Do you all know what a Stolperstein is? So we uh, put one in, in front of, this was my mom's house when it was bombed in 1944. You saw the apartment building before. And we had this sign up in front of the construction site. And these are the stones that they did for my family. You see them? So you can walk around and you see them on the ground and that's where different Jewish families lived who had to flee. So I'm back to my question. How do you think we can fight anti-Semitism? And racism and nationalism? You know, the nationalism of Russia is what's causing the Ukraine war because Putin would like to have one Russia again the way it used to be. That's very nationalistic, isn't it? And um, when different groups fight, I, this is a nice multicultural group. I don't know if some of you experience some slight hurts, because I know that sometimes people say things and they don't maybe mean it, but it hurts. Like I told you, my grand, my husband is black. Do you know in the States, when he would walk down the street in, at night um, and a white woman would pass, they would cross the street because they were afraid of him. I mean, he's such a gentle person. But this is what happens. In the United States, they just passed a law that we can't read the book Mouse, which is about the Holocaust in a lot of schools. It's on the banned book list. And in Texas, they're trying to say that slavery, you know what slavery is? Yes, was involuntary relocation. That is a bunch of BS. That is so horrible because those people didn't want to move. When I was here, we were here in Ulm in the, in the Mosterplatz, a man came up to my husband. And do you know what he said to him? He's like, they stole you from my country. You are from Nigeria. You look just like my relatives. And then my husband did his DNA test and that is where he was from. But anyway, what can we do to combat it? What can you do for your friends? Because um, I can tell you that racism is alive and well and it hurts. And like I said, I think Germany has done a much better job than America, but we have to work at it all the day, every day. We have to fight to make things better for all people. So for me, you have to know your history. If you don't know your history, history repeats itself. It's very important. And when you see something, if you see somebody say something that's racist, don't be silent, speak up. You guys have an example? You want to share what you were talking about? Remember, I was a teacher. Yeah, so um, we should all be friends. And so it doesn't matter where you come from. So you could be friends with Russians and black people and Asians. You can get friends. What did you say to her? I said that she's my friend. Ah. But remember, friendships are fragile. You have to really work at it. My mother wrote in a different diary entry. Yesterday was the most popular girl in school, and today nobody will talk to me. So you have to work at it. This is very fragile. I'm here and I keep thinking, oh, I made so many friends and all. But if some terrible leader came in power again, would it change for me? Am I still safe? I ask myself that every day. But thank you, that was a good comment. Anybody else have comments about that? How many of you have experienced racism? You want to talk about it? Can I put you on the spot? Um, I don't really want to go into specifics, but especially in elementary school, um, children just are pretty stupid and 
say stuff that is very offensive yeah. without even thinking about it. Um, yeah, no, it's also racial. It's just when I was little, kid, there were a couple of comments and I didn't really like, think about them, but now I think back, I'm like, oh wait, that was racist. I didn't even realize. You don't realize. And sometimes they're tiny little things. We call that microaggression because it's not like blatant, like you can't join my club. Maybe you just move to a different seat. You never know. Um, so I suggest it's very important that you work across lines. Don't make these lines only Germans with Germans. You know, everybody should mix. Everybody should learn and meet each other and maybe go to your homes because you can learn about another culture. Every culture has beauty. Relationships matter. I used to say, I used to teach leadership, and I used to say, what are the most important things in real estate? Do you know what real estate is? Buying houses? And so the realtors would say, it's location, location, location. Where you live matters. But in leadership, because all of you are leaders, you should be, the thing that matters is relationships. Relationships, relationships, relationships. Build relationships across lines. It's really important. And the other thing I would suggest is to educate. You know, your teachers are working on educating you, but you can educate everybody else. You can educate your teachers. I heard a story that people that graduate from this school wrote back to the principal after they graduated and talked about the racism that they experienced here in this wonderful school. It happens. We just have to keep working on it all the time. And it's important to be political. Do you know what that means? Because if you just be quiet, then you can get really bad leaders. Look what we had in the US. We had Trump. And it could happen again. You must be political. You can't just say, someone else can take care of that. That's not my job. Because then, when a different leader comes in and it's not a good leader, you have to live with those consequences. And you may not be happy. So be political. Make your life matter. Be like Sophie Scholl. I'm not saying be beheaded, but be like her. Stand up for things that matter. And there was a very famous poem. I don't know it in German, but you probably all do. First they came for the socialists, said this minister. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one to speak out. And they put him in a concentration camp. He was a minister, a Christian minister. And he spoke out against Hitler, and he was sent to a concentration camp. It matters. Speak up. Don't let things just go under the table. Thank you.
a member of a, a union, uh, like teachers' union, uh, plumbers' union, electricians' union, and you had to, um, if you were in a trade, you had to belong to the union to become in the trade. Gewerkschaften. Yeah. What do you call it? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I Yeah, but I can't hear. I can't hear. Yeah. Jewish, that when I was growing up, I was told I was only half Jewish. My father was Jewish and my mother wasn't. There was a boy in high school who wanted to date me. And he said, well, are you Jewish? Because my parents say I can only date a Jewish girl. And so I went home and asked my mother, and she said, tell him you're half Jewish. And so I did, and so he said, which half? And I said, my father is Jewish. 
And he said, well, that's the wrong half. I can't date you. So I was really unhappy because I didn't fit in to the point where my parents transferred me to another school that was Christian. And it wasn't until I was 18 that I learned about Albert Einstein saving my mom. And I said, well, do you have the papers? And she said, no, I burned them because I was so afraid to be found associated with a famous Jew. I thought that they might kill me. So that's how serious it was. My mother got Alzheimer's disease where you lose your memory when she was 89 years old. And when she um, was 89, she started to forget that it was bad to be Jewish. And you know what? She started seeing the rabbi then, when she was 90, but not before. She used to babysit for her friend's kid who she had to take him to Hebrew school. My mother would drop this boy off two blocks away from the synagogue because she was so afraid to go near a synagogue. So you can imagine what the trauma was that she experienced in high school and, you know, she, she, uh, she was 12 when Hitler came to power, 12 to 18. Those are really important years where you work on your identity about who you are as a human being. And, and she was so messed up from it. So I didn't know anything. Yeah, so here I am now, I'm a senior citizen, and I'm learning about my identity. I've been all over Europe. My dad was, like I told you, from what is now Serbia. So. I've been, he studied in Vienna. I've been, my grand, his mother was from Hungary, so I've been to his, to Hungary, to Serbia. Then I found down there a marriage license that his father was from Austria, but it's now Ukraine. And we went there. Um, I've been all over, and I'm writing a book about it. Yeah, maybe you'll read it one day. Another question? I don't know. My first trip to Ulm was in 1977, and um, I was expecting a baby. And I thought, oh, you know, I need to go to this magical place, Ulm, where my mother was from, and and find out about my history a little bit. And um, when I got here. I was carrying heavy suitcases, you know, women can do everything, right? And I started to, to have a little bit of bleeding, and I went to a doctor here, but I didn't have national insurance. And I think this guy was a little bit racist, because he told me, oh, you can do anything. You can climb to the top of the monster. You're healthy. And guess what? I did climb to the top of the monster. And guess what happened? I lost the baby. I lost the baby the day that, I, El, uh, that Elvis Presley died. And all everybody was crying about Elvis, and I was crying about my baby. So that was my first trip to Ulm. And at that time, I was a little scared, because everybody that had gray hair, I wondered if they had wanted to murder me or my family. I was terrified. The next time I came was 1997, and by then, did you ever hear of the generation of 1968? Yeah, so they started to be powerful. They were the, the young people who questioned their parents and their grandparents about what happened during the war. And so there was a new outlook. And so what happened is um, they invited the former Jewish citizens back to Ulm. And my mother invited me. And my mother, I realized afterwards, because my mother never really talked about what happened. And it was like when I went on this trip where I learned about Hans and Sophie Scholl 
And I met all these people that it turned out I was related to. Now, I grew up with no relatives, so it was like really a big deal for me to have relatives and people I was related to, even if it was distant. It was more than I'd ever experienced. And so in 1997, I came and I, got, I learned a little bit. And I got interested, but I was working. I had young children. And then in 2004 was the 125th birthday of Albert Einstein. And she got only invited only seven relatives, closest relatives. And my mother was one of them. And so I came with her on that trip. And I started to understand a little bit more. And then I started to like look for my dad's stuff too, but I didn't know, you know what I'd find. And um, I was looking phone books for people with the same last name because my maiden name is Glennert, and it's a very unusual name in, in the US. There are no Glennerts in Chicago except us. So I started to do some research. Then in 2012, um, the city of Ulm opened up the new synagogue, and I was invited to come for the ribbon cutting. And there I started to really have more of a Jewish identity. Before then, I really didn't have one. And at that time, I started to learn about Judaism myself, because I wasn't, you can't teach what you don't know to your children. And my parents didn't teach me, so I didn't really know much. So I started to attend classes to learn. Then, in 2018, I was invited to Ulm to give a talk about Einstein and my family. And I was like, okay, I gotta learn. So I started to learn. And about the same time, I told you my mother had Alzheimer's and we had to sell her house because we couldn't afford to take care of her. We had to have you know, all this nursing and it was very expensive. So when we sold the house, we cleaned it out and I found in a desk, in an envelope, a letter my dad wrote in 1963. Now my dad has been dead since I was 25, so a long time. He'd been dead 40 years, and I find this paper. And it was like a curriculum vita of all the places in his life. And so then I asked the historian from home, I said, well, if I come to give the talk, would it be okay if I stay in Europe and start researching these places? And they said, yes, we believe in history, so do it. And so I started with my husband, and we took one month's trip. And the following year, we came for two months. Then we came for four months, and now I've been here a year. And um, it just, every time I would tell the story to people, they said, you should write a book. So I started. And that's really what happened. And um, I'm still getting my voice. And it's still, I have to tell you, it's still hard for me to admit I'm Jewish. I have a hard time. When I'm with Jewish people, it's fine. When I'm with other people, I don't. When I came to Shalom and I registered as a, as a citizen and a resident, the woman in the office, she asked me, well, what's your religion? Now, in the US, you can't ask people what their religion is. That's against the law. So I was like, what do you mean? And so my first reaction was, do you know what I said? Christian. And then my husband, who was sitting there, said, Karen. You came here because you're studying your Jewish family. You can't say that. So I told her I was Jewish. And then she kept asking more questions. And I said, well, aren't you going to ask about my husband? Oh, I just assumed it was the same. And you know, talk about racism. She never talked to him. It's like he was invisible. Only me she talked to. And so, um, and so she said, well, I assumed it was the same. And I said, but it's not the same. He's Christian. Oh, which church? Because now he has to pay taxes. And so I said, it's okay, he's Jewish too. <laughs> and then um, I have to tell you that that experience terrified me. Do you want to know why? Because to me, it has nothing to do with taxes. But if another Hitler came to power in Germany and went to Stadt all you have to do is press a button and all the Jews are listed with their address, they could come for me. So I still have a lot of trauma and angst. It's, it's not easy. Um, and I know things are good here, but I also know that things could change. Look what happened in Ukraine from one day to the next. It was a wonderful country, it was beautiful. I've been there. 
And now look what's happened. So anyway, that's that's my answer. Anybody else have a question? Morning in progress.